Hi, how's it going? My name is Carl Diaz. I'm with the Learning Resources Center here at the University of Colorado Denver. And today we're going to be looking at three circular motion problems. Uh, one with a car kind of going in a circular track, right? So this is a cross section. The car is going in a circular track. If you need to see that kind of from the top view, the car would be here, right? Moving in a circular track. But this is a cross sectional view so that we can draw our picture. We're going to deal with some Kepler's law, looking at a little rotation, and then we're going to then again use uh, some circular motion in terms of, again, this thing is rotating. If we were to see the system from the top, this would be the person. They'd be rotating if we're looking from the top. This is just a cross-sectional view to do our free body diagram, so let's get started. All right. So again, the thing to remember with everything moving in a circle is what? That it has net force towards the center. That's what makes you move in a circle. So every time you're moving in a circle, you know you're gonna be using Newton's second law because there's net force there. If you're also sitting on a surface, then you might also use Newton's first law to say that you're balanced. So Newton's second law will describe the net force towards the center of motion when you're moving in a circle, right? And if you're balanced on a surface, well, Newton's first law can describe that. If you're confused about this, go watch the concept video on circular motion then come watch this, okay? Because this might not make any sense unless you know the concepts. In fact, it won't make any sense unless you know the concepts. So go watch the concept video, come back here if you don't know what I'm talking about, okay? All right, so, like I said, this is just a car going in a circular track, all right? It has some friction, all right? And as it moves around the track, right, the net force towards the center. Remember, when uh, you've learned in class when the car's moving in a, in, in a circular motion, on the track and there's friction, it's the friction that keeps the back end from sliding out, right? So it's the friction that allows the car to move in a circular path, right, at a certain speed. And we know every, every distance, every radius has a certain speed um, associated with it, no matter what we're talking about. That's just the concept that we know, right, from our circular motion concept um, video. But if we didn't pull it away from there, remember that, that every radius has its own speed that you can safely move at at that speed, right? If you move, start to move faster, you're gonna have to uh, 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 either get further away or closer to the object, or faster or slower, right? If you start to move faster or slower, you either have to get closer to the object or further away from the object, but you can't stay at the same place and be stable, right? You, you need other things. We're talking about stable systems. So this thing's moving in a circle, right? This is just a cross-sectional view. If you were to look at it from the top, right, it's moving in a circle, like looking at the top of a car going in a racetrack. This is just a cross-sectional view, all right? So we need this cross-sectional view to draw our free body diagram. The question wants to know how big of a circle uh, this is, or what's the radius of the, of the track that, that, that the car is on, is what it's being asked. And we were given the weight, the speed, and the mu of the, of the track, right, which is part of friction which we know that I have that written up here, part of our tools of right, friction and mu and normal force. We'll get to that in a second. All right, so first our free body diagram, right? We want to talk about the car. So the car is moving into the board, but in a circle. So it's balanced on the ground, right? So the weight down, normal force up, those are balanced, right? Because it's balanced on the track in terms of the Y. And then, like we said, it's moving in a circle, right? There's a net force, even if we look at that circle, towards the center of motion, right? In this case, it's the friction that's the force towards the center of motion for this, right? And if that's the net force, we know it has a, so, you know, a rate of change of motion associated with the net force. And in this case, it's what we call a radial acceleration, right? Okay, so now we want to start with our free, our, our equations based off of our free body diagram to start to solve for the radius of the track. So we, again, we know in the x direction, it's Newton's second law because our free body diagram is perfect and we know there's a net force in the x direction. Newton's first law for the y direction, right? Then we want to fill in this side of the equation, starting with the x. Well, there's only one force in the x direction for the net force in the x, so we just write that, friction. And if there was more forces, we put it. There's not, so then we're done. M, and then equals the ma, right? Where the a is, is a radial acceleration, right? Then what we want to do, I kind of... Uh, swapped AR in for V squared R. Now we know AR is also equal to omega squared R. We want to be careful, right? If they gave us omega or something or asked us how, how fast we were moving, like spinning or something like this, we'd want omega. We were given velocity, so we knew we wanted this radial acceleration. We're given velocity pretty much all the time in here, so that's the radial acceleration we use. But don't 
think that that's the only one. We could also use a radial acceleration that's equal to omega squared over r, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Watch the concept video, look at your equation sheet. Okay, so we swap this radial acceleration into v squared over r because those are what we were given, right? We have those values, we need that. And then we swap friction out for mu times the normal force, okay? Because um, we were given mu, we weren't given friction. We can't look at just friction, okay? If we were, then we could have just kept this as friction, but we weren't, so we have to swap it over, okay? Uh, the next thing I do is I say, hey, well, I don't have the normal force, but I know I can get it, right? So after looking at my free body diagram, I fill in the sum of forces in the y, which is the normal force up, right? Then mg's down, so minus mg equals zero. Then we can solve for the normal force, right, which is equal to mg. And we can put that in this equation, right? So this normal force, right, it's going to pop right in this equation, and that's what I did here, right, where that n turned into this mg, right? So I had mu mg equals m v squared over r, right? This mv squared r over r stayed the same. But then there's masses on both sides, right? Because the mg, right, the normal force turned into mg. And this mass, and they're the same mass. We're talking about the car, so they can cancel. So we want to cancel those out, right? And then we see that we're left with um, mu times g equals v squared over r. And we're looking for r, right? We can see it's right there. So we just kind of want to swap r with mu mg, right? So mu mg will come down, r will come up, and that is going to be the radius of the track there, okay? So again, the idea here is circular motion. We had net force towards the center of our motion. That's what that is. It's not like there's... Right? You've got to keep in mind what we're talking about here. We're talking about this car's moving in a circle. We're talking about well, what's, what's causing it to move in a circle, what keeps it moving in a circle at the speed it's moving at, and it's that friction, right? Sometimes it's other things. In this case, it's the friction, right? But the friction is the net force towards the center of the motion causing the circular motion. Remember, this is about circular motion. All right, let's uh, come back to this center one here in just a second. Let's come over here because it's kind of along the same lines as this, all right? So this is an amusement park ride where you spin real fast and they drop the floor underneath you and you stick to the stick to the wall. You stick to the wall and the floor will disappear and it's spinning really fast, right? So we want to draw a situation for that. The, the question is asking us what's the mu uh, of the wall that you're stuck to, right? And we can find that using circular motion. So this is the normal picture, but that's really hard to draw a free body diagram on that person. So we change that to a dot, it's easier to see. But again, this is also the cross-sectional view. This person's spinning right there, that's the picture of them. There is a net force towards the center of their motion, right, which is gonna be this way, but they're spinning like this. This is a cross-sectional view. Just like this car was spinning like this, they're spinning like this, okay? So this is just a cross-sectional view, all right? And then the next thing you wanna do is draw the free body diagram on this picture, right? Again, circular motion, right, and everything that we're looking at here. So. We know that the person is, is pressed against the wall. We know the normal force. There's no definition of the normal force about weight. Normal force is just about your applied force to a surface. So if we're, if we're pressing against the wall right here, there's a normal force pressing get back on us. Now, remember we talked about centrifugal and centri centripetal force. This is a centripetal force. Centrifugal force is a fake force that's, that, that forms, but it's not a real force. It would be here, but we don't draw it, okay? It's just a cent uh, um, uh, centripetal force that we're talking about, or that net force towards the center of motion. So you're saying, well, shouldn't normal force be balanced with something? Yeah, but don't worry about it, um, because it's something that we really don't look at, but the normal force is going to be there because we're applying, uh, we're, we're touching the surface of the wall, right? We're not necessarily applying our weight to the wall, neither. It's just something we have to be careful about. So that's not an applied force, that centrifugal force. That's another reason why it's not there. The normal force is really the only applied force just because we're touching the wall, right? We're kind of stuck to it, but we're not stuck to the wall because we're putting our weight against it. We're stuck to the wall because of friction is not allowing us to slide down. So that's why the normal force is there. Only the normal force, not an opposite force towards the X, okay? Just because we're touching the wall. We're not pressing against the wall. We're just touching the wall. And since we're touching the surface, there's a normal, what we call a normal force there. So that's a force towards the center of motion or the net force in the x direction that's keeping us, you know, moving in a circle and, 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 and allowing us to move in a circle and not slide up and down. And then we see in the y direction, right? Well, if the floor is not underneath you, you want to fall down to the floor, right? 
but something's not letting you in those rides. You're stuck. You're not, the floor's way down there and you're not touching it. And what's not allowing you to do that's the friction, right? You want to slide down. Your weight want to slide, wants to slide down, right? But the, the wall, right, has friction between your, the, the, whatever material you're wearing, right, and, and whatever the material the, the wall's made out of, you're going to slide against each other and cause friction. That's going to stop you from sliding down, right? So it's the friction that's counteracting your weight. The friction's pushing up as you want to slide down. So the friction is actually what's keeping you up in the air. So friction is up, MG's down, all right? So that's our free body diagram. Again, the normal force is the net force is the center of the motion. So that means there's a rate of change of motion, a radial acceleration towards the same direction as the normal force, because that is the force towards the center of motion here. We're spinning like this, that's what we know. Okay, so perfect free body diagram. Now we can write our equations from it. Again, we're looking for mu, so mu will be in friction. So we gotta remember that when we're starting to play with it. Just don't forget that we know this, and we also know that friction is equal to mu times the normal force, right? So let's start with our x direction. In the x direction, our sum of forces are equal to the second law. We've explained why over and over, right? And they're both floating in the positive direction. Everything's positive. Normal force is the only force there. And then so we can finish with the MAR, right? Does that make sense? We've done this so many, so watch all our videos, because by this time, that should be pretty straightforward. Okay, and then we want to turn the radial acceleration into V squared over R, because that's its definition, and that's what we were given. We are given the radius and speed, right? All right. And then we're kind of done there because we don't know what to do with that. It's like, well, we're looking for mu. Yeah, normal force is going to help me, but where the heck is friction going to sit? Let's get the equation for friction. Then we can do something with this, right? So that's, we see that our friction's in the y, so we want to do some of the forces in the y are in equilibrium. Remember, you're stuck on the wall. You're not sliding up or down, so you are in equilibrium in the y, right? And then the forces in the y are friction's positive. Right, weight is down, so weight's pointing in the negative, so minus mg is equal to zero, those are the only forces in the y. Right, now we don't know friction, but we, uh, uh, and, and we're looking for mu, right, so we need to take friction and turn it to mu times the normal force, and we just, the mg stays there, minus mg equals zero. And the next thing we need to do is turn the normal force, we're like, hey, what's normal force? Well, we had it, right? That's, what the, that's where this equation comes in handy from the x. So we're going to put it in this equation, right? When we sub it in, we see that it's mu times mv squared over r, which is what this is. That minus mg stays put and equal to zero. And then what we do is we look here and we can see that, that a few things are going to happen, right? So we can see the mass cancels, right? And we're left with just mu times v squared over r is equal to g. Right, and then remember, we're looking for mu, so it's just as easy as bringing r up to the g and v squared underneath the g, which is what we have here, and we have mu, right? So there's mu for you with all the givens that we already know. Again, g is 9.8, all right, we know that. All right, so those are both looking at just traditional circular motion and net force. This is more using Kepler's law, but it's still circular motion, right? There's a net force towards the center of the motion, like when we're, when we're revolving, when a smaller object is is orbiting a larger object, the reason that's causing that is the gravitational force, right? So that gravitational force is always the force towards the center of motion for things in orbit, whether it's the Earth around the sun, the moon, oops, I didn't write moon, but this is the moon. I should write that properly. Yes. So that the moon, right, this is Earth over here, right? The sun, Earth, right? So whatever satellite, this is moon orbiting Earth, this is the Earth orbiting the sun, or we could even look at uh, satellites orbiting the Earth. They all work off circular motion, or what we say Kepler's law. All right, so we have a few examples, one with the Earth orbiting the sun, the other with the moon orbiting the Earth. We want to make sure we understand these equations. So again, we have on our first question, we're asked for the speed, right, of Earth. How fast is Earth orbiting the sun? Well, we can use that use circular motion to find that, right? We know how far, um, oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's this. We know how far the sun is from the earth. That would be the radius, right? We know the mass of the sun, right? We know the mass of the earth too, but it wasn't given to us, but we could look it up if we need it, but we might not even need it, right? And again, we're looking for the speed of earth. How fast is earth moving around the sun? All right, so we start very simply. This is a little nice because these both have X and Y, both of these questions, are just going to have an x, right? Because it's just one force, the moon 
right, is being, it's moving around the Earth because of this force. There's, it's not sitting on a surface or anything like that. So there's no normal force or these things, right? And same thing for Earth here. So starting with this one, looking how fast Earth is moving, we want to start with again circular motion, and we know there's a net force. I just got done explaining for things in orbit. Smaller things orbiting larger things. The net force, the force towards the center of motion is always gravity. So that's really all we're going to have in our free body diagram, right? I should add acceleration. I should have radial acceleration in that same direction, um, which I'm missing off these pictures, but those are crucial, right? So we both know that there's some rate of change in motion. Oh, I have it right there. <laughs> and right there. I, I'm getting blocked, right? And we don't know the rate of change in motion will also be towards the net force in terms of circular motion, that's radial acceleration. So let's now write our equation based off our free body diagram, right? We know the sum of forces in the x, right, are gonna be the force of gravity is equal to uh, ma, or in this case, mar. Now again, I'm not starting like we did here, but we could have started here and then said the net force is equal to fg, but we're kind of saving some time here. So we know the net force is equal to the force of gravity and then equal to mar, right? That r is just a subscript. All right, and then we kind of want to play with these things. So we know the force of gravity, right, between two objects is equal to that G, big G constant, which you'll be able to look up. I didn't write over here, but that's everywhere. You can just find it. It's a given, right? M1, so the big M is the sun. I wrote it here, but you should know this equation as that. This is the large object. This is the object in orbit. The small M is the object in orbit. In this case, it's Earth, right? Big M could be Earth if, in this case, if little m is the moon, okay? So in this case, not the big M is the sun. I have it written right here, which is m1. m2, which is little m is the earth, right? So we write that and over r squared. So again, this is the, the for gravitational force equation, right? If I need to write it, I'll write it right here separate, but just know that that's what we're using in terms of the force of gravity right there. And then that's equal to MAR, where AR, again, is turning into D squared over R, which is what we did here. Now, we're looking for V, right? So we wanna go ahead and look at this equation. What we can see is once we've written it out, there's masses in here, right? So those masses are gonna cancel, right? And we wanna rewrite that equation as G, big G, big M, right? So the little M's cancel, the M2 cancel. M2 was on both sides, which is what Earth was. We weren't given the mass of Earth, but that's good because it looks like we don't need it, right? And that's something that we know from the concepts of Kepler's law, right? Kepler's law tells us, right? If you watch the video on Kepler's law, it tells us this, okay? It's very, very important that you know this, that the speed, the, how fast this object's orbiting the larger object has nothing to do with the mass of the object orbiting the larger thing. That's what this is telling us mathematically. That's a concept you should know, all right? So it doesn't matter how big this thing is out here. What matters is the thing that it's orbiting. This, the speed of the thing out here has nothing to do with how large it is. It has to do with how large the thing it's orbiting is, right? This is what this equation is telling us because the mass, the small mass, the Earth, cancels and we're left with just the sun's mass in there, right? Which means it's important. Now, when we look at this equation, right, we can see that we need to solve it for V, so R needs to come over, right? Now we have R squared over R, where those R's are gonna cancel, right? And we're left with just GM over R is equal to V squared, okay? And then it's just as easily as just doing the square root of that, right? Because it's V squared. So again, once these R's cancel, one R is going to cancel up here, and it's just going to cancel out the square down here, leaving that R alone and the GM1 on top, right? And since this is V squared, we just do the square root of that, and that's a velocity. So that's how fast Earth is orbiting the sun right there, okay? All right, now let's move to the next one. This last question is just asking us how far. Now it's the radius, right? But the question was how far is the moon from the Earth? Right? When we were told how fast the moon's rotating the Earth, and we were given the mass of Earth, and we want to know how far away the moon is from it. Well, again, we can use circular motion to find this, right? Free body diagram is pretty straightforward. The moon is only moving around, the only net force on the moon that's causing it to orbit around the Earth is the force of gravity, right? We know that the force of gravity is this, so we write sum of forces in the x, and that's the x, right? That's that's where the force of gravity is drawn in terms of our 
our, our, our coordinate system, and we know that's the sum of forces, right? The net force in the X is the force of gravity is equal to MAR, because it's circular motion, right? We're using the circular motion concept. We're saying the net force towards the center is equal to the rate of change in motion, but in this case, right, the rate of change in motion is the radial acceleration, right? And then we fill in the equation, so FG is again, big G, big M, which in this case now, big M is gonna be Earth, little m is gonna be the moon, right, over R squared, and then we wanna modify A squared to B squared over R, right, but M stays the same, and this is M2 here, right, on this side, because we're talking about, how, and you might be asking yourself, Carl, how did you know on this side when you turned, when you're looking up here, how do you know that this M and this M are the same? Well, I dictated that small m is always gonna be that, right, but, this, remember, this is the net force trying to affect the object. The object in motion is Earth. The object in motion here is the moon. So that little m is the object that's having the rate of change in motion. The sun's not having a rate of change in motion on it, so that can't be the mass. The moon's not having the rate of change in motion on it, so that can't be the Earth. That has to be the thing in orbit of the larger thing. That's how we know what that m is, okay, in case you're wondering. How did you know that that's this thing how did you know that M is not this thing? Because this thing isn't experiencing the rate of change of motion. All right, so once we have this all expanded out, right, we can again see what happened up here, but we're gonna save some time. We don't wanna go through all those steps like I told you before. I did it up here, but you wanna kinda of be able to do what we did down here, right? Where we can see that the M squareds are gonna cancel. This squared for this R is gonna cancel, and that R is gonna cancel all the way, right? Because this R is gonna come up here, just like in this step. Right, we have this situation with the r on top of the r squared, right? Uh, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I said that backwards. When we go to solve for r, I'm so sorry, r squared is gonna come up here, and then 2v squared is gonna come down here, but when r squared is gonna come up here, it's gonna cancel that r on the bottom, leaving just that one r on the top, right? But you wanna see all that before it happens. You can say, hey, I know this r is gonna cancel with this r squared when this comes up here. Because we know the plan is to move r squared up here, and, and, to move M, and to move this V squared down here, right? Because that M2 is gonna cancel, right? So the point is just to move the R up there, the V squared down there, but we know when R squared moves up there, it's gonna cancel. So the final equation, right, that we can write before we solve for R, right, is just this V squared, right, GM, big G, big M, which is gonna be Earth over R, right? Because that R squared just canceled. The r under the v squared went away, and so did the m, so we have this nice equation. Then we just solve it for r, so we bring r over here, bring v squared uh, underneath, so I can see I totally did that backwards here. Sorry about that. But again, so r is gonna swap up here, right? And we're left with gm over here under v squared. I apologize, I just had that flip. I don't know why I did that. But again, so that's the distance that the moon is away from Earth using circular motion and things we were given, okay? So I hope this was helpful. Again, this is covering circular motion and looking at the net force towards the center of an object. Please go back and watch this multiple times. Go back and watch the concept videos that match this so that you're able to make sense of it. And I'll see you on the next video.